If you thought the last Saturday in April was a big to-do on the Osable River, well, the last full weekend in July might just top the trout opener as the busiest on the river. This is the weekend of the Osable River Canoe Marathon. With a cult following, paddlers will race the entire length of the river from Grayling to Oscoda throughout the night. Billed as the toughest spectator race in the world, competitors from around the world come to compete. It's the longest, richest, toughest canoe race in North America. We start Saturday night at 9 p.m. and the race runs till Sunday morning in Oscoda. We'll finish about 122 miles later. Many canoe races are held around the U.S. and Canada, but the Osabo Marathon is the one to watch. The day before the race, teams sprint downstream then back up to determine their starting position for the big race. Come 9 o'clock on Saturday night, racers are in rows several blocks from the river, ready to run down to Ray's Canoe Livery and start their grueling 120-mile journey to Lake Huron. Right off the bat, probably, is just making it to the river um, safely, without falling, with all of your equipment and everything, and um, kind of getting out of town, settling in, and adjusting to the night. The neat thing is, is that you, know, you can slowly adjust to the night. Um, there are, you know, some hazards. The fog can be a problem. Um, besides, of course, all the physical things that could, can stand in your way, but. This is a journey that few canoeists do at all. Typically taking several days and camping along the way, the top racers will finish around 14 to 15 hours later. Obviously, the equipment is much different. Most boats are Kevlar or a composite material weighing in at just over 30 pounds. Specifically designed for speed, there's few similarities with a typical rental boat, except they both float. Racing paddles from ZRE will weigh under 10 ounces, which means that competitors are exerting much less energy than typical paddling requires. Crowds start gathering on Saturday in anticipation of the exciting start. Festivities include all sorts of entertainment, and you'll never know who you'll run into down at the start. The marathon is a homecoming of sorts, and you may see anyone from senators to sports commentators. I think I've been to the last uh, 10 or 15 of them anyway. It's, a, it's just a wonderful homecoming for me to get back to Grayling. And I think it's a, a terrific way to draw attention to, you know, one of the great trout streams in North America, really, the Asabo River. Well, the, it's the flying start, frankly, you know, that Le Mans start, these guys got to carry those canoes for a mile and scramble into this uh, river and hopefully stay uh, upright so they don't, you know, take a bath before they start this 120-mile uh, trip. So it's wild here at the beginning. I mean, if you have never been here to see it in person, you should. Just before the race, introductions begin. The race has seen its share of characters throughout the years, from paddling greats like Jay Stefan and Ralph Sawyer to dominating families like the Stocktons, Kelloggs, and Corbins. Everybody has their team to root for. But no matter how big the cheers are for the fastest canoes, the crowd goes nuts when local Mayo legend Al Whiting Sr. is introduced. A veteran of over 35 marathons and over 80 years young, Al continues to push downriver at an incredible pace. Racing with partner Bob Bradford, there are over 50 races between them. Patrick, Al Whiting Sr., Robert Bradford, watch him go. Less than an hour later, the cannon sounds at 9 p.m., signaling the start of the race, and soon the teams can be spotted running to the banks of the mighty Osable. You know, we, t we used to take trips down the river all the time uh -huh. and and still do occasionally, but can you imagine going all the way to Oscoda and paddling all night? And, you know, we got people uh, of all uh, all ages and, uh, you know, you got gals in the race and young guys and older guys. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. And I'll tell you what, they're athletes. They are athletes. You can't do this if you're not an athlete and you don't train. After the frenzied start in Grayling, long lines of cars start the journey that will end the next morning in Oscoda. Along the way, there are many different spots to watch canoes pass. 
Some are on the beaten path, some are not. Spectators watch from bridges, docks, cabins, and other vantage spots along the length of the river. Everyone has their own spectating pace. Some race down river to catch each and every glimpse of the boats, while others sit around campfires and just cheer for paddlers as they pass in the night. Throughout the night, pain, discomfort, hunger, and thirst will set in for the competitors. The shouts of encouragement in the middle of the night are what help the racers maintain sanity throughout the course. It's the best feeling there is. It's um, down along McKinley, when you get below McKinley, there isn't a whole lot of it and you smell the campfires going out and you just kind of have to mentally get yourself back up. Um, having those people along the bank, and they, they don't even know you, they're just terrific fans of the race and they'll shout your name out and um, it's awesome. It's a pick-me-up. It, you can literally almost start to feel the boat go a little bit better. You know, it's um, just a great, great rush. Several hours into the race, the novelty and adrenaline has worn off for the teams. The monotony of paddle strokes becomes routine and energy is slowly draining. This is where the paddlers depend on a network of chasers who deliver food, drinks, and other essentials to the boat. Often consisting of 10 or more members, feeders move into the river to get competitors the nourishment they are quickly needing. Well, you, you got to know, know where to be in the river. I mean, it's just not a matter of going in the river. You want to be where the best current is and where their line's going to take them. And in the dark, it gets a little deep sometimes. Some, some of the feeds are, are kind of rough that way, and there's a lot of times there's lots of other feeders in the water too, so that gets a little confusing. But, so we try to get down far, as far away from everybody else as we can, but that puts us in deep water sometimes, but it gets the job done, I guess. It's been over five hours of paddling through the night as boats approach the first of five portages over dams. Lights can be seen bobbing across Mayo Pond, and soon the bright lights will reveal who is in the lead. Legs have been cramped up in the tight canoe since running down the streets and grailing, and now the teams must approach the dam, jump out, empty trash and water, then run across the top of the dam in the dark, and then down a brightly lit gravel embankment in front of hundreds of onlookers. It's now after 2 in the morning, and the crowd is the biggest we've seen since grailing. For some, the portages will be very tough, breaking the smooth pace in which they've been checking off the miles. For others, it will be a welcome break to finally stretch the legs and move freely for a few minutes. You know, you've been in a boat for a long time, and you've gotten used to that. Your legs sometimes don't want to go. I'm thinking, remembering coming off of Alcona Dam once and with my brother, I paddled with my brother Ted and it was an extremely cool night. 10 degrees colder than they thought it was going to be and we had a lot of fog and it had been cold through the evening and your legs just, legs and feet didn't even want to move. You know, it felt like you had cement at the bottom of your feet. So sometimes that can be it but quite honestly I look forward to getting out of the boat and moving my legs and you know, uh, getting the circulation going again. By Alcona Pond, the crowd has dwindled as dawn is starting to break in front of the leaders. Al Lindbergh and former winner Jim Harwood put about six minutes of river between them and the next canoes by the time they reach Loud Dam. The real race is behind them for second. A group of young but experienced racers are neck and neck. Andy Trebold and Matt Reimer finished second together in 2005, and Andy won with Steve Lejoie in 2004. Right alongside were the Halstead boys, Rod and Ryan. They each had a few marathons under their belts as they paddled towards Oscoda. Over the last dam, we were running neck and neck with uh, Matt and Andy and for second and third, and we expect the same result when we get here, if not probably a few seconds apart from each other. How are the guys doing? The guys are doing real well. They've been eating well the hot night. It's been a long night, but they're doing really well. We're uh, hopefully going to make a push here to the end, see what we can do. Coming over Foot Dam, the race for second is about the same. The teams take on food and water one last time and begin the push for the finish line, which will be about 45 minutes or so away. It's about now the sense of accomplishment kicks in. Thousands of people await the finish in Oscoda to cheer their teams. Oh, wow. It's, it's gruel it can be grueling, exhilarating, um, everything. It, it, it's just it encompasses so many feelings. For as bad as you feel, maybe during that race, and in the end, though, there is just nothing like finishing that race. Alan 
and Jim have had a great night, finishing about 15 minutes in front of the Halsteads and 17 before third place Treebold and Reimer. It has been a fight, but one that will be remembered. Some paddlers race their whole lives and never see the first place welcome. Spectators have witnessed some close races in the past. In 2005, the finish came down to less than a canoe length. This is one of the great northern traditions that has to be seen in person. Who knows what the race might hold as it crosses into its sixth decade. Maybe we'll see you next year in the middle of the night on the Osable River.